The First World War was a conflict like nothing the world had ever known. Over six million people were mobilized in the UK. Of those, more than 700,000 would be killed and a quarter of a million of them would have no known grave. The grave of the unknown warrior became a place where all those people that were denied a grave to visit could come to remember their loved ones. November 2020 marks 100 years since the unknown warrior was laid to rest here in Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is one of the most special buildings in the world. It's a place that encapsulates and distills English and British history. In here are buried monarchs and bishops, generals, admirals, scientists, poets and politicians. And at the heart of it is the tomb of the unknown warrior, 100 years old this year. The true identity of the warrior is a mystery, but there are a number of clues that point at certain battlefields from which the body might have been recovered. To find out more, I met with Justin Saddington, curator of the Unknown Warrior exhibition at the National Army Museum. Justin, how are you doing? Hello, welcome thank to the National Army Museum. Thank you for having me here. It's a very special anniversary of this, isn't it? Indeed, it's a hundred years ago since the uh, Unknown Warrior was laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. I thought we'd done with all the First World War centenaries, but here's another one. No, Coming this along. is the most important one of all in terms of the acts of commemoration, um, yes. Traditionally, uh, the commemoration of war has really been about great leaders and great heroes and great victories. Uh, so the poor old ordinary soldier has largely been ignored or forgotten or even treated with contempt. It's about hero worship rather than about the, the ordinary soldier. After Waterloo, for example, they built um, mass graves and funeral pyres. So they burned the bodies and buried them without care or without sentiment. They didn't list the names for memorials. It's pretty shocking compared with what we're used to today. That's not even the end of the story, really. There, there's a kind of even darker aspects to it, really, which is that bodies would often be looted. You know, thieves, souvenirs, hunters would descend upon the battlefield and go over the bodies first. Teeth would be extracted from the skulls to make dentures, the famous Waterloo teeth. And uh, there's even strong evidence that um, bones were dug up uh, to make fertilizer, so they're ground down. Um, so yeah, it, it's a pretty uh, sorry tale and, the, and the, the poor old British soldier was not well treated traditionally. Eventually you do get this growth in the ideas of democracy and, and kind of class consciousness, which kind of chips away at this great men version of history and starts to raise in people's minds the idea that people are uh, equally worthy you know, of being recognised and commemorated. Uh, so that's, that helps to lay the groundwork. So too does um, changes in attitudes towards death and mourning. Um, uh, life expectancy grows throughout this period, uh, infant mortality in particular drops. So um, people with children um, expect them to live and they, and they invest more in them emotionally than they would have done a century ago. And so therefore it's, it's more of a shock and more of a trauma when they do die in this kind of horrible, unnatural way, which is war. Uh, so you do get these kind of broader long-term changes throughout the 19th century, but it's, it's really the special circumstances of the First World War which really change uh, how it's commemorated. Industrialization had changed war. Gone were the days of mass cavalry and infantry attacks. In their place came artillery, poison gas, and the tank. The scale of the conflict was unprecedented. It's hard to imagine the levels of carnage, destruction, and slaughter. More than two and a half thousand miles of trenches were erected along the 466 mile Western Front, which stretched from the English Channel to Switzerland. Opposing armies took it in turns to launch massive attacks on each other with earth shattering artillery bombardments. Whole battalions were wiped out in a matter of minutes. Communities left bereft of sons, husbands, fathers and brothers. 
The total death toll of the war has been estimated at over 15 million people. During the war, the government takes a decision that bodies are not going to be brought home, but are instead going to be buried in special cemeteries near the battlefield. And this is a bitterly controversial decision, which again uh, brings the issue of, of soldiers and how they're going to be commemorated into sharper focus. One of the great problems of the First World War, which can be illustrated by this map behind you, um, is that bodies were scattered all over the battlefield, uh, not only in uh, graves, but also many of them unburied. And many of these bodies, of course, could not be identified. And so you had this huge problem of the missing as well. These blue figures are the number of known graves in each grid location, so they don't even provide a full insight into the number of bodies that are on the battlefield because, of course, many were missing and never recovered. But they do give a, a powerful insight into the scale of the task that confronted the men who had to clear the battlefields. But that is a, that is a huge number of bodies. And, and those are all initially just wooden crosses like this that a battalion will stick in the ground? Yes, to... I mean, okay. clearing the battlefields of the dead was initially the responsible of the relevant army units. So, you know, you go in and clear up your mates' bodies effectively and you do that whenever a lull in the fighting would allow and then you'd have a, often an improvised kind of uh, uh, funeral service. But it was never the kind of full befitting service that you might expect today from a, from a soldier, some, a person who'd given their life for their country. Retrieving bodies for burial was a, an absolute nightmare. It was extremely difficult and could really only be done by when lulls in the fighting allowed it. So in quiet times, and uh, you'd send out uh, a party of men to retrieve as many bodies as you could. But it was a, a haphazard and, and piecemeal process. And of course, thousands upon thousands of people would, would have been simply have to be left on the Western Front because it wasn't practical to get them. Others had just been completely blown to pieces or um, drowned or in, lost in the, in the kind of quagmire that the Western Front had become because of the, the heavy shelling. And so they simply couldn't, couldn't be retrieved. During the war itself, uh, the Church of England set up um, what were called street shrines. And they were actually set up partially to say prayers for the living. But of course, as the casualty lists grew, they became places where people did commemorate the dead. So this process of commemoration did begin during the war itself. But it, obviously, it, it, it was only after the war when it, it really, we see a step change. Um, the main reason for that is that um, there has to be a a stiff upper lip maintained throughout the war. You know, people have got to keep it together. You know, this, the huge outpouring of grief can wait. And the battle was won. Armistice Day, 1918. On November the 11th, 1918, the guns fell silent. Four years of war had finally come to an end. Huge celebrations were seen up and down the country and across the Atlantic in North America. For many, it was an occasion to celebrate, but for others, it was a time to grieve. For four long years, the nation had held itself together, whilst mothers lost sons, wives lost husbands, and children lost fathers. Now it was the time to grieve for those lost. Almost everyone would have known someone who died in the conflict, or a family that had lost a loved one. The end of hostilities resulted in a huge outpouring of grief, the like of which the country had never known. At the same time this is happening, across Europe a huge clean-up operation begins, as British troops begin the gruesome process of retrieving, burying and attempting to identify their dead, many of which had been left to lie where they had fallen. The painstaking process would be carried out by troops in all conditions, with little to aid them but simple tools like shovels and picks. The man who's most famously associated with the clearing of the battlefields and the establishment of the cemeteries is Fabian Ware. And uh, he was originally a, um, an ambulance driver for a Red Cross unit. And he becomes aware of the fact that bodies are being left all over the place, or graves are often being unrecorded. And this is a huge problem. And so he, eventually a British Army a unit, which evolves by 1916 to become the Directorate of Graves Registration and Inquiries, is employed to First of all, keep track of all the various graves, then after the war, it takes the lead in actually clearing up the battlefields. 
quite skilled as well. It's very tough, very grueling. Obviously, it's physical. You've got to dig and you've got to navigate your way across the, what would still be a very lunar, shell-scarred landscape. And it's also utterly gruesome. You can imagine the toll that digging up bodies uh, all day will take on someone's mental health. The, uh, the, the particularly tricky thing is identifying the body once you've got it. Um, bodies can be identified in a, in a number of ways and to a number of degrees. So ideally you want the person's name and their regiment so you, you really know exactly who they are really. But um, failing that, you at least want to know his nationality or his, or his branch of service. Um, and so they'd have to do this by looking at the kind of tattered remains of the uniform to try to identify it, perhaps find some personal effects. Sometimes they wore bracelets. Sometimes they wore identity tags, but the, the problem with the tags was that they um, were made of a very uh, poor material which decomposed and broke down very quickly, which is an incredible oversight. So you kind of think that that would actually happen. But um, yeah, in short, it was actually quite skilled work as well as being uh, pretty grisly. Amongst all this suffering, it was recognised that something needed to be done, something to help alleviate the grief of the hundreds of thousands of families had lost a loved one, but had nowhere to mourn. The solution was the Unknown Warrior. The idea for the Unknown Warrior was really the inspiration of uh, Chaplain David Relton. Um, now, Relton served uh, as a chaplain on the Western Front with the British Army in the First World War and uh, would have been very well acquainted with all the various problems of war dead that we've, we've talked about. And um, what really triggered it was uh, just an encounter with a, a rough wooden cross at a place called Armentier in France. Uh, on which was inscribed an unknown British soldier. And this really got him thinking, and there's a, a great quote here, which is that um, he describes how I thought and I thought and I wrestled in thought, what can I do to ease the pain of father, mother, sister, brother, sweetheart and friend? Quietly and gradually there came out of the mist of this thought an answer firm and clear. Let this body, this symbol of him, be carried reverently over the sea to his native land which is quite a nice kind of poetic inspiration that he had, you know, choosing one body of, the, of these many multitudes of missing to be sent home to Britain to be the symbol of, of all who'd suffered such a grim fate. What's interesting is that because Railton didn't take any action, he sat on the idea, it might never have happened had Railton not in um, August 1920, uh, finally belatedly decided to take action. Um, after much um, consideration, he decided to write to Herbert Ryle, who's the Dean of Westminster Abbey, uh, with the suggestion that a body be returned for burial in the Abbey you know, to be this special symbol of the dead and the missing. Uh, Ryle was uh, totally inspired by the idea and uh, really ran with it. He approached the King, King George V initially, but surprisingly the King was a bit sceptical about it. He said it was a bit belated, this was two years after the war, it might reopen old wounds that were just beginning to heal. Uh, and so he got a little bit rebuffed there, um, but not to be deterred, Ryle also went to uh, David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, who was much more enthusiastic and succeeded in, in changing the King's mind. announcements appear in the press and the press kind of run with the idea and the initial announcements they're made in the press very much give the impression that the, the man chosen um, will be chosen from any one of the British Empire's dead from the from the Western Front. But in the minutes of the Memorial Services Committee we get this um, strange uh, idea that the, the, the um, the body should be that of a, a soldier who died in 1914. Now this is, comes about because of a request from Westminster Abbey that they want the body to be only bone. And we presume that the reason they have that, make that request is because they don't want the body to be um, a rotting corpse. They don't want to put putrefying flesh underneath the Abbey. Um, this, of course, as I say, goes completely against the, uh, the popular understanding that the Unknown Warrior could and should be any one of the uh, unknown dead from the Western Front. How do they choose the Unknown Warrior? Well, the selection process is um, perhaps the most uh, uh, exciting, interesting and, and mythical part of the whole uh, story, really. Um, it was obviously done in great secrecy. Um, anonymity was fundamental to the concept. So if any, um, uh, any ideas or any kind of suggestion about where the body had come from or who the body might have been had been leaked to the press, it would have spoiled the whole thing. The aura of mystery would have been shattered, really. So uh, great secrecy was uh, employed throughout and no official um, statement about how it was actually done was ever issued. 
And uh, this, of course, has led to um, great speculation, but also a multiplicity of stories, because eventually the story was revealed uh, for, from different perspectives of the, of the men involved. The two most important accounts are by uh, uh, General Wyatt, who was the commander in France at the time, and he wrote an account uh, initially in November 1939 to the Daily Telegraph. Um, but this was um, really an answer to a group of accounts which had originated from this chap, a chap in George Kendall, but which had been circulated in the press in the 1930s and been somewhat more elaborated and, and, and distorted. And so uh, Wyatt was attempting to set the record straight by giving what he thought was the most authoritative account. And by and large, Wyatt's is the most authoritative account. And he outlined how he asked for four um, exhumation parties to be dispatched to the major battle areas of the Western Front, including Eat, the Somme, uh, I think the other one was Arras and Aisne. Um, each task was bringing one body back to his headquarters at St. Paul near Arras. And there on the night of the 8th of November, 1920, he went into the, the chapel where these bodies had been laid out and, and personally chose the one to be the unknown warrior. So in the afternoon of the 9th, the unknown warrior was taken by motor ambulance to an ancient chateau at Boulogne. There he was placed into a very special coffin, a coffin that had been made of uh, English oak from a tree that had grown in the grounds of Hampton Court Palace and was mounted uh, with a crusader sword from the King's private collection. So a magnificent coffin, really. He was then uh, taken on board HMS Verdun, a British destroyer, uh, which had been chosen for that because it bore the name of France's greatest victory of the war, the Battle of Verdun. So it was a way of honouring the French people again. and then conveyed in escort across the channel to Dover. He was taken to Victoria Station and he got there on about 8.32, I believe, on the evening of the 10th of November, where he was guarded overnight by the Grenadier Guards. Following morning, of course, the, the grand uh, uh, state funeral took place. There was a, a 19-gun salute from Hyde Park, fired by the Royal Haas Artillery. The coffin was placed on a gun carriage and it was covered with a Union flag, which had been used by David Railton as a, a, a pall, so to cover the bodies of dead soldiers and as an altar cloth during the First World War. So it was a really holy relic that had actually been you know, seen war service, this flag. So it was uh, quite a magical thing to, to place that over the coffin. Thousands upon thousands of mourners came out, ordinary people, to, to watch the procession. I think there were about 30,000 troops, something like that, lining the streets just to form a barrier to keep everyone back. So it was an absolutely colossal event, witnessed by probably several million people, one would expect. The procession wound its way past Buckingham Palace, down the Mole to Trafalgar Square, then down to Whitehall where it halted for the unveiling ceremony of the newly rebuilt stone cenotaph. So the cenotaph had originally been a wooden structure, a uh, temporary structure. The calls had been gone out for it to be rebuilt in stone and become really the permanent uh, national war memorial for Britain. The unknown warrior is then taken onto Westminster Abbey where the, the funeral service is held. The congregation of the Abbey is comprised of near a thousand bereaved mothers and widows of, of, of servicemen who've died in the war. So as you can imagine, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house. It would be, again, just a, an electrically charged with this very solemn and poignant emotion. The aisle is flanked by the, the most illustrious honour guard ever assembled, uh, which is comprised of 96 highly decorated servicemen, including 74 winners of the VC. So you'll never see uh, an assemblage of, of, of decorated soldiers and, and other servicemen on that kind of scale again. So it really was a, an incredible affair, really, and quite befitting for what is the greatest act of commemoration this country has ever seen. People travelled from all over the country to pay their respects to the Unknown Warrior in what must have been a poignant and symbolic moment for many of those people whose lost loved ones could never be identified. It's thanks to the vision and emotional awareness of individuals like Chaplain David Railton and Herbert Ryle that the nation was able to come together in the way it did 
and attempt to begin the healing process. A hundred years later, the grave of the unknown warrior, partnered with the cenotaph, remains a symbolic monument to our war dead. It's a constant reminder of the untold suffering and loss of a nation. Beneath this stone rests the body of a British warrior, unknown by name or rank, brought from France to lie among the most illustrious of the land and buried here on Armistice Day, 11th of November, 1920, in the presence of His Majesty King George V, his ministers of state, the chiefs of his forces and a vast concourse of the nation. Thus are commemorated the many multitudes who during the Great War of 1914 to 1918 gave the most that man can give, life itself, for God, for king and country, for loved ones, home and empire, for the sacred cause of justice and the freedom of the world. They buried him among the kings because he had done good toward God and toward his house. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.